So hello everybody, my name is Matt Woods. I am the technology evangelist uh, for Amazon Web Services. I cover the whole of Europe, the Middle East and Africa. And that basically means that I get to come to events like this and talk to smart people such as yourselves about cloud computing in general, about the Amazon platform specifically to answer any questions that you have, and then to take all of your feedback, all of your questions, and use that to map out our product roadmap uh, with our teams around the world to make sure that we're building out products and services uh, that you guys uh, actually want to use. Uh, so today I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about uh, building games. Uh, so how you can use the Amazon platform to build games. You're all game builders. Um, but slides are boring. Let's play SimCity. So uh, I spun up this little game. I'm going to call it Sim Game. I'm going to use this as a sort of example of uh, how I see games, how I see games have moved and transitioned over the past 20 years. And we'll use this as a sort of example of uh, some of the things that the cloud can do for you, some of the pain points uh, that cloud computing can help you reach uh, when you're out building games. Uh, so here we have uh, my SimCity. Uh, you can see I'm using SimCity Classic because I'm old school like that. Uh, I've got Gamesville up in the top right hand corner. I've got a certain amount of funds as you have uh, in all your Sim games. Uh, we reticulated our splines and we've got no population. Uh, this is where you start when you start building out a game. You have a great game, you've got no players. Uh, we're in March 1985 now. Uh, and what happened in March 1985? Um, people started to build out games. So games required a certain amount of infrastructure. They required a certain amount of power. They required a certain amount of talent to create those games. Developers, different environments, uh, artists, and all the rest of it. They required a certain amount of commercial support. Uh, so the studios, the publishers, and all the rest of it. And they had a, a reasonable size but limited uh, core gamer target audience. Right? These are the games that were going to go out buy the consoles, buy the Sega Genesis, and start playing your games. And uh, if you manage to hook all of these things up correctly, uh, build out a bit more infrastructure, put the power lines in the right place, uh, then hopefully uh, you started to have uh, some customers. Uh, they started to build their homes and started buying the games, buying those silver platters, buying those cartridges uh, to plug into your device. And you started to generate uh, some, uh, some customers, started to generate hopefully some revenue. But there's quite a lot of work involved in all of this, right? So your funds are going to go down before they go up. In time, stepping forward to 1995, games are getting bigger, more audacious, interactive movies are happening, we've got a slightly larger audience, slightly larger target audience, but the amount of infrastructure required to build out these games in terms of developers, in terms of creative talent, in terms of the building blocks that you need to build these things is starting to increase, and so the, uh, the cost associated with launching these games is also going to increase, but hopefully you fill that out with a larger audience, more gamers to sell into. Moving forward to 2005, we start getting towards uh, web gaming, social gaming, starting to evolve. Uh, the internet as a whole has evolved as a platform. So now you've got a larger distribution as well. You've got an even larger audience. But the amount of data you're generating, the amount of talent, the amount of effort, and the amount of infrastructure required to deliver these games, even to this larger audience, is uh, starting to increase. Now fast forward to, uh, to this year, March 2012. You've got an enormous target audience. These guys are dripping off the walls. They're everywhere on your social networks. Uh, you're building out deep, engaging content, which is delivered to a very, very large audience of uh, what you can consider casual gamers. This is a large target audience that your games can reach. Now, the problem here is that you've got even more infrastructure. You've got even more cost associated, even more overhead uh, involved in building out trying to reach these customers. So uh, you can start to use some, uh, some different tools to drive even deeper engagement, to drive long-term uh, engagement with your customers. Things like social networks, like Twitter and Facebook, I'm sure all of you are building out on these platforms. You start to build out additional features uh, for your games, uh, like achievements, leaderboards, uh, you've got downloadable content, so your relationship doesn't just end when they start buying the game and start working with it. Uh, and of course, you can deploy across multiple devices, uh, across Android, across uh, different uh, platforms as well. And all of this hopefully takes uh, your accessible audience, the people that are going to play your games, uh, that you want to keep happy, and turns them from this rather sparse population uh, into an enormous population. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, into an enormous population. So you've got hundreds of millions of potential customers now, hundreds of millions of people that can play your games. That requires even more infrastructure, right? So you're going to need more power lines. You're going to need more developers. You're going to be rolling out updates more uh, efficiently. And all of these different uh, features, uh, social media, leaderboards, achievements, they need to be stored somewhere. They need to be distributed. Downloadable content needs to get out to these customers. So by using these tools where there's a very low barrier of entry to get started, you're driving a larger audience. Uh, but uh, there's a significant infrastructure significant amount of work in continuing to build out that relationship. So you need more power plants, basically. 
You need uh, disaster recovery scenarios. You need to start thinking about security and all that sort of thing. And hopefully, you don't end up doing all of that work, building out all of these building blocks, all of this infrastructure, uh, only to have nobody turn up to play your games. Right? There's a risk associated in building out all of this infrastructure if you do it in a traditionally provisioned way. If you have to go out, build data centers, think about storage, powering, cooling computers, and all the rest of it, uh, that's a lot of effort to go to. That's a lot of cost. And there's a lot of risk associated with that, uh, because nobody can come and play your games. So you're already in the red, and you've got no players. What you want to do is reach this huge audience uh, of casual players playing on all these different devices, hooked into engagement with your game through social media, mapping their social graph, taking advantage of downloadable content and all the rest of it, to build out a large, thriving ecosystem of players for your game. So that basically comes as a challenge. right? So you've got very spiky requirements for your gaming uh, based in time. You can have a lot of customers one minute and no customers the next as the natural cycle of gaming. People starting to come up, pick up your game, work with it, tell their friends that they're playing it, and you get a huge explosion, a viral lift of people playing your games. Uh, but that can ultimately subside. So you have very spiky requirements, and those spikes can happen at a particular point in time if your game is supporting a particular event in the real world, for example or just over the natural course of a day, uh, where people, uh, hopefully, when they get home from work, start playing your game, or in most cases, actually, when they're at work at their desks, dialing into their social network uh, for a quick game of Scrabble. So you've got very spiky requirements, and you've got very unpredictable uh, usage and distribution volumes. So you're not really clear at the beginning of the game inception how popular your game is going to be, uh, whether it's going to be a, uh, a, a sim social game or whether it's going to be less popular. And the amount of work involved in getting that out there uh, is considerable. So there's a challenge involved in doing that. Then you've got large upfront investment, uh, buying the servers, buying the storage, buying all of the infrastructure to actually get that out there uh, so that people can start playing your game, whether it's going to be a success or not and whether it's going to be utilized or not. So you can spend a huge amount of time and money building out infrastructure to deliver these games through the browser, deliver downloadable content to your customers uh, around the globe, uh, but you can ultimately end up with low utilization. So that's a lot of money spent, uh, which is not actually going towards uh, delivering value to your customers or to delivering value to your business. So how can cloud computing help? Um, well, I think there are really three focal points that I'm going to talk about today about uh, how the cloud can help. Uh, the first is the cloud can help in providing infrastructure. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the experience that Amazon has built out in delivering the sort of infrastructure you need to run a service like Amazon.com to run very social, uh, social games. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about audience development, uh, what you can do when you start building in social engagement features, when you start making use of the social graph to drive viral lift to get more players for your game. And we'll talk a little bit about how the cloud can build, help you build uh, responsive organizations. So how you can use the data which has been generated by your players, ask questions of that data, and iterate quickly on your ideas to make sure that you're delivering, um, and delivering uh, happiness for your players. And when I finished uh, talking in here, I expect all of you to leave and go to Hall D, because uh, uh, my colleague, Carlos Conde, who is one of our solution architects, is going to be doing a slightly more deep uh, technical dive on how you can actually use these services to build out um, batch distribution systems, to build out high-scale systems, to build out automation, and to build out uh, games on the platform. So I think the sweet spot is somewhere in the middle here. And this is uh, the target uh, that the cloud aims to deliver. This aims to deliver value to your infrastructure. It aims to deliver value to your audience in building out responsive applications. And it aims to deliver value to your business in building out a responsive business. So it's really this, this overlap, this central point uh, that I think the cloud can help overcome some of the challenges. So uh, how can we learn from Amazon? So uh, some of you may be familiar uh, with, with Amazon as a company. Uh, actually, just as a quick uh, frame of reference, hands up if you have uh, an Amazon account for buying books or DVDs or games or anything. Awesome, that's everybody, good. Well, the good news is that's all you need to get going on the cloud. You can log in with your Amazon credentials and get started up and running straight away. So uh, you may be familiar with Amazon.co.uk, Amazon.de, and all of the other retail sites that we run, but Amazon is actually just a, a technology company uh, that happens to run a bookstore. Uh, so uh, we started out, uh, what, 16, 17, 18 years ago now uh, as a technology company, and the retail uh, business was the first business that we went into. Uh, we've diversified since then, and we now have three main areas to our business. 
Uh, we have the consumer business uh, that you're all familiar with, uh, selling DVDs and books and games and all the rest of it. We sell quite a lot of those. We also have a seller business or a merchant business. Uh, this allows customers to take advantage of some of our uh, operational experience in running uh, e-commerce platforms. So you can hook into the Amazon platform in uh, various different ways, uh, whether you are a large corporate business like Marks & Spencer or Timex and Samsonite. Uh, if you buy anything from their online stores, all of that runs on top of the Amazon platform, all the way through to our marketplace where individual sellers can sell against Amazon and against each other on the Amazon platform direct to customers. More choice, lower prices, customers are more happy. Uh, the third spoke of our business is uh, Amazon Web Services. Uh, what we call web services has sort of come to be known uh, as cloud computing. And this is our developer business. And this is what I'm going to spend most of my time talking about today. So we've built out uh, decades of experience in running large-scale, uh, spiky, uh, unpredictable usage uh, websites, uh, much like we see on Amazon.com, uh, where we have a huge influx in the evening when everyone starts buying their gifts, and we see a huge increase at the end of the year as everyone starts buying their Christmas presents. And that all takes operations, it all takes a huge amount of management and a huge amount of scale just to be able to deliver a good experience to our customers. Um, about five, six years ago, uh, no longer than that, five, six, seven, eight years ago now, we started allowing programmatic access uh, to some of our services. Internally, Amazon is a very service-oriented com company. Uh, everything that we do, from our recommendation system to our login system, is built as a service internally. And uh, about, uh, yeah, about seven years ago now, we started exposing some of these services to external customers. Uh, we allowed customers to query the metadata, for example, associated to our catalog. We allowed customers to pull down album artwork and all this sort of thing. And what we saw was an unexpected amount of innovation. We saw customers able to take this information, take this metadata, build it into their products, and build out very innovative new features uh, for their own games, and for their own customers, and for their own businesses. And uh, we had a sort of uh, blinding flash of the obvious. Uh, what if we could take the same approach in exposing our experience and management of delivering this information, of managing it at scale, and apply that back to our data centers? What if we took those same APIs, the programmatic interfaces which allow people to interact with that data, and use that to provision the infrastructure uh, to build uh, whatever services that they wanted? And this is where Amazon Web Services came from. So this is not excess capacity left over from Christmas. Uh, this is a separate uh, part of the business, a separate subsidiary, separate sibling of the Amazon family. And in fact, the retail side of the business is just another customer to us. So they run on exactly the same infrastructure. There's no separate Amazon cloud or anything like that. They use exactly the same tools in retail uh, as you can use to build out your games. Um, so the goal really is to build on our experience, to not have to go through uh, all the problems that we had to face and solve in order to be able to deliver application, in order to be able to deliver content at scale. So the first sort of area that I talked about, one of the focal points, uh, was, was, it was infrastructure. So I'm going to take a little bit of time just to talk about that. So the goal when you're building a game is to move from your idea, your initial concept, and move that to a, a shipped game that's in customers' hands that people are playing uh, pretty much as soon as possible. The problem is that uh, we saw this uh, inside Amazon, and we see a lot of our customers uh, in gaming and in uh, a lot of other areas that come up against this. About 70% of your team's time, uh, when you're moving from your idea to your game, is spent with what we call heavy lifting. This is undifferentiated work, which doesn't provide value to the end user, doesn't provide value to your business. It's just the cost of getting from your idea to your game. This is basically just friction. Um, so here I'm talking about, in, back in our sim game, I'm talking about the power plants. I'm talking about security and disaster recovery. I'm talking about all of the infrastructure required, your dev, your desk, to, uh, to provision, your dev environments, your test environments, QA, staging, and run a production system. So this is a lot of heavy work, uh, irrespective of the number of customers that you're expecting. So this undifferentiated heavy lifting is what we try to remove. Uh, we've gone through the pain of building out these services. We've gone through the pain of uh, making them available and making them work well. And so our goal is to allow you to remove this overhead, to move from uh, infrastructure being friction in moving from your concept through to your game, and move that to becoming uh, an accelerator for the process. So infrastructure is friction, and that's because in a traditionally provisioned infrastructure, whether you're co-locating your infrastructure, whether you're managing your own storage, whatever it is, uh, it's expensive. You have to go out, you have to build and procure them. Uh, I've spoken to a lot of customers that uh, have month-long procurement cycles. 
from getting the payment order uh, signed off to actually getting a piece of infrastructure, compute or storage in their data center ready for use can take months, many, many months. And that's expensive and time consuming. And once it's there, it's static. You've paid for it. You have to you try and utilize it. You have to try and make use of it. And uh, it can be very, very underutilized. That's just a waste of cash. So going back to our challenge is how can we, how can we remove these problems? Um, well, in the cloud, we move from having these spiky requirements to having full elastic infrastructure. Uh, so this is the platform that Amazon has built out. Uh, all of the retail, uh, public-facing websites run on exactly the same platform, and a huge number of games from Zynga, Playfish, and Wooga run on exactly the same platform. And they take advantage of this elasticity to remove these spiky use cases. So if you've ever had uh, be the beginning of the, uh, of the game-making process, once you've been greenlit, and you actually start in the process, starting to move through staging into a production environment, you've probably tried to predict the capacity that you're going to need going forwards. So if you'll excuse my rather crude business school 101 graph, uh, this is time against some measure of capacity. And hopefully your predicted capacity is going to go up over time as more and more people start to play your game. Based on this, you start to fill out your capacity. Um, so you have, over on the left-hand side, a, a large chunk of change just to enter the game, just to start playing. Uh, and then as you start to reach the limits of your capacity, the limits of your demand, you have to put down more money, more chunk of change uh, to increase uh, your capacity. And you end up with this sawtooth approach of building out capacity for your games. So each of these big steps up is matched with uh, a significant investment, and you have to find that money from somewhere, uh, whether the game is going to be successful or not. Now, of course, the problem is that real demand doesn't look anything like your estimation. It's very spiky. Uh, it goes down as well as up. And it starts all the way down over there on the left-hand side. So over on the left-hand side, where we have a gap between demand and the capacity that you've provisioned, um, this is wasted money. These are disks that are not spinning, servers that are not serving, but you still have to cool and power and maintain and all the rest of it. This is the friction that I'm talking about. This is this undifferentiated work. You guys just want to build games, right? But here you are spending time fixing broken servers, which will definitely break. So that's a, that's a waste of money. Over on the right-hand side, uh, where the red line demand starts to exceed your capacity, now you have the opportunity cost. This is business opportunities that you can't fulfill. These are customers that want desperately to play your games, to look at your adverts, to give you their data. Uh, but you can't fulfill it because you've got this, uh, this statically provisioned infrastructure. More friction, unable to meet uh, your, your company's demands and your customers' demands. So in an elastic infrastructure, as we provide in the cloud, uh, we provide elastic capacity. You can increase the, the amount of capacity that you need uh, as and when you need it, uh, and you can decrease it uh, when you no longer need it. And because uh, in the cloud, you're only paying for what you use, as soon as you see a drop in utilization, you can drop your capacity, and you have a cost saving there. So it's a much more efficient way of working. And you can survive these inflection points. So where this, this, the bottom of the hockey stick starts to go absolutely crazy, uh, this could be the launch of a Facebook app. This could be just uh, half past five in the evening when everybody starts to play your game. This could be when your, your event happens or your TV show that you're supporting starts uh, on the channel that it's running on. So you can still meet these large areas of demand, uh, but you still have this capacity and you don't pay for it until you actually need it. So elastic capacity is a sort of fundamental tenant of working in the cloud, and it provides a lot of advantages for businesses that, that can take advantage of it. So the second problem we still have is this unpredictable usage and, and distribution volumes. Um, well, we have this high-scale infrastructure, the sort of infrastructure that powers not just Amazon.com, but also games from Playfish, also games from Zynga, and uh, can power your game as well. So it's highly scalable infrastructure. So Netflix, uh, they do uh, DVDs through the post uh, in the US. Uh, they also do uh, a lot of their uh, video streaming and content delivery, uh, increasingly running on, on AWS, on the AWS platform. And this is a nice sort of vignette from them. Uh, so uh, they're very kind to let us use this information, so thank you to Netflix. So Netflix needed to transcode 17,000 titles, right? So that's 80 terabytes of data uh, to be ready for the, for the PlayStation 3 launch. Um, now, in a traditionally provisioned infrastructure, they'd have had to find that capacity from somewhere, and they'd have had to pay for it, and it would have just been sitting there doing nothing. In the cloud, using this high-scale, elastic environment, they can just dial it up. So they provisioned uh, 1,200 uh, EC2, that's our Elastic Compute Cloud, 
compute service uh, instances. They're just servers. And they completed the whole transcoding process in just a couple of days. So this is a, a very agile, very high-scale use case that anybody can take advantage of. And they were totally ready for the PS3 launch. And this is some more data. Again, thank you to Netflix. Uh, they did ask us to, uh, to um, obfuscate some of this. So we go over several months here and many thousands. And you can see just how spiky the delivery of this content is, from transcoding to test and production utilization to log analysis. Very, very spiky, high-scale use cases. And this is very commonly seen uh, in gaming as well. Animoto is another great example. Anyone here familiar with Animoto? Animoto is awesome, somebody over there. So Animoto takes your, uh, your photos and a song, and it does beat detection on the song. It makes a, a nice animated video slideshow, all in 3D, it looks fantastic. Uh, this was their utilization. Uh, so they were running quite happily on around 80 individual servers. Uh, they just had a website up at this time, 100% built on, on the Amazon platform. And uh, just here, in, uh, back in um, March, I guess, May, April, sorry, in 2008, they released their, uh, their Facebook game. This is a Facebook app that they launched, and you can see the viral effect that this had. This app took Facebook photos and pushed their uh, finished uh, transcoded video back onto Facebook for all your friends to see. And you can see the viral effect, the viral lift that that had. And had, these are a, this was a small startup. This was just a couple of guys that were running on AWS. And they were able to meet this tr a tremendous demand. They built out a very, very successful business, and they continue to do so uh, on top of the Amazon platform. Now they take advantage of uh, graphic processing units to drive high-definition video. They have a paid-for service. They're doing, going uh, gangbusters, basically, uh, because they were able to meet this initial spike. In a traditionally provisioned infrastructure, they would have had a hard cap on the amount of customers that they could serve. They would have had very, very long wait times on rendering the videos. They wouldn't be able to meet this large business opportunity that the, uh, that the social network provided for them. And this is exactly the increase in uh, customers that I talked about in my sim game example. Reaching this level of customers is challenging to do at scale and is really enabled by, by cloud computing. So we still have this problem of large upfront investment uh, with traditionally provisioned infrastructure. Um, well, in the cloud, we have zero up front. All of our customers start at zero dollars. Uh, you just sign in with your Amazon account. As long as there's a credit card attached, uh, we can get going straight away, and you only pay for what you use. So there's no CapEx. There's no need to come down and talk to me about the amount of scale that you're going to need or anybody else on the Amazon team. Uh, you just get started. You can launch your instances. You can launch your storage, uh, and away you go. So there's no upfront payments. So we have on-demand provisioning. Uh, you can just jump up onto our website. You can make an API call to start provisioning the amount of storage or the amount of compute that you need. If you have some idea of the amount of capacity that you're going to need, so if you have a game that's already running that you want to make take advantage of elastic capacity, uh, you can bring that up onto the cloud, and you can reserve that capacity ahead of time. Now, at Amazon, one of the things that we do share with our cousins in retail is uh, the goal of driving down prices for our customers when we achieve sufficient economies of scale. So what the reserve capacity allows us to do is plan more efficiently, because uh, you reserve that capacity for one to three years ahead of time. Uh, that allows us to plan our own operations more efficiently, and so we offer a lower rate of running your, uh, your server, uh, your storage uh, per hour based on that reservation, based on that increased efficiency. So reservation capacity is a very good way of dropping down costs if you're running something between 20 and 100% of the time, like a database server or something like that. We also have a spot market. Uh, so the spot market allows us to achieve large economies of scale and, again, pass those savings back on to you. So if you imagine uh, the utilization of our own data centers, uh, a certain amount of that is filled up with uh, the reserved capacity that I talked about, customers having a good understanding of what they're going to need. A certain amount more is filled out by people just provisioning on-demand capacity, stuff that they need exactly at that point in time. And we have enough customers, hundreds of thousands, that uh, that's filled out. So one customer's peak coincides with another customer's trough. So that's pretty stable overall. But you can imagine that we still have a certain amount of excess capacity. And we allow customers to choose the price that they're willing to pay for that capacity so it's utilized and we achieve our economies of scale. So you can bid against that capacity. You can say, I have a task, uh, some uh, analytics that I want to run, some questions that I want to ask of our data. And it's, uh, but it's not that important. It's time insensitive. And you can make a bid against that capacity. 
as the uh, spot price drops beneath your bid price, we'll provision that capacity for you and you pay the, the lower bid price. So it's a very cost effective way, particularly for batch or scale out systems of achieving very, very large uh, economies of scale. Perfect for web hosting, perfect for asset delivery, perfect for transcoding, all those sort of things. So these three different areas make it a, a, a very uh, affordable platform. And we try and remove this low utilization problem by only paying for what you use, as we talked about already. So this comes in if you have a, a simple daily usage curve. Uh, so you have some time of day again, and you have some utilization of your capacity over time. So this is a simple day and some amount of usage up the side. In traditionally provisioned infrastructure, you have to provision 10 to 15% over your peak. But you can see there's a big gap between the red line, real utilization, and the, uh, the blue line, which is your, 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 your infrastructure, your provision throughput. Um, and obviously, that's just wasted money. So there's 60% of cost savings you can get just by responding more quickly. So we can spin up new compute infrastructure in the minutes time frame, and you can respond that quickly. Uh, and you only start paying for that infrastructure when it spins up. And when you spin it down, you stop paying for it. So there's large cost efficiencies involved in running this. This makes you more agile as a company. And uh, yeah, agility is really what a lot of our customers stay for. So if cost efficiencies are the sizzle, then agility is really the stake. That's what customers keep coming back for. The ability to be able to meet new business objectives, build out new gains with lower risk, and uh, keep their customers happy. So the goal really is to invert that 70% that we heard that we heard about earlier and move that from 70% just spent on undifferentiated work, remove that overhead and make 70% of your work spent on actually delivering value for your customers and delivering value for your gains. And we want to contract that to as much as possible at Amazon so that your idea is as close to your game as possible. Really move them very, very close together so you're much more able to respond to customer demand. And as I say, agility, the agility this buys you is really what keeps people coming back for more. The business agility to be able to deliver uh, more games more quickly with a shorter time to market. So some of our customers, uh, just quickly, that are taking advantage of this. Zynga, I'm sure you're all familiar with. Playfish uh, run 100% on Amazon Web Services and always have done, uh, all the way uh, through to their, their current titles, such as SimSocial. Um, and a bunch of all these other guys, from Media Molecule all the way up to Sega, and all of these other guys, uh, see me in there, uh, that run uh, MMOs uh, in the browser on, on our compute platform. So there's a lot of customers taking advantage of being able to reach customers on a global scale and be able to reach customers' ongoing needs. So a quick note uh, on security. Uh, so I'm going to focus in now on the police station uh, that we popped in there in, uh, in our SIM game. Um, so it's very important to understand that uh, we operate a shared responsibility, a shared responsibility model uh, when it comes to security. Um, so Amazon undertakes the security and to provide the security for basically the infrastructure level. So everything from the foundations of our data center all the way up to the hypervisors of our virtual machines, that's on us. Beyond that, uh, the applications that are running, the operating systems that are running on the compute, and the data housed within that, the responsibility of securing that and meeting your own regulatory needs uh, falls to our customers. So this shared responsibility model and uh, working with our customers to be able to achieve that is very, very important. So we have requirement-based access, so nobody goes anywhere near our physical infrastructure uh, without having a very good, uh, very good reason, and those reasons are audited both internally and externally. Uh, we're ISO 27001 compliant. We have service organization controls uh, at these various standards, uh, which make security people very excited. Uh, and we have detailed logging on all of your assets, uh, so you know who's accessing what where, and you can mine those logs to your heart's content. We also have PCI DSS level one. This is a payment processing standard. And this is a really good idea, a really good example of the shared responsibility model. So we are infrastructure providers at PSI DSS level one, and we're certified to that. But the application, uh, which runs on top of that, uh, uh, process payments, also needs to be certified to reach this level uh, uh, of regulation. So it's a good example of, of the, the two, Amazon and our customers, working together to reach these very, very high levels. And these are some of the control objectives that we certify against. Uh, security organization, employee lifecycle, background checks, and all that sort of thing. The logical and physical security of our data centers, secure data handling, environmental safeguards, uh, so fire suppression systems and all this sort of thing. Change management, so what we do when we make a change to the platform. Incident handling, how we handle things when they go wrong. And uh, data integrity and availability and redundancy. So uh, you can't quite see that, but that's a globe. That's an Earth. 
Uh, it's a bit washed out, but I hope you get the idea. Uh, this shows where you can put your data on the Amazon platform. Uh, so we have seven different regions across the world that you can load data into. Uh, we have uh, over on the West Coast, the East Coast. We launched down in, uh, in South America, in Sao Paulo. We're over in Dublin, in Europe, and Singapore, and, uh, and Tokyo as well. And you can choose to host your data and host your applications in these different regions to reach a much more global audience. The important thing is that data stays local. So your data assets, your payment assets, or your player data, if you have good certification reasons why it can't move out of a certain geography, uh, we won't mirror that data across these regions. So the point I'm trying to make here is that you retain control of your data. Uh, you retain ownership of your data, and you control where it goes and who does what with it. If you want to know more about that, uh, we have a couple of white papers which you can read about, uh, aws.amazon.com security. So I hope that gives you a sense of the infrastructure that Amazon had to build out to help us achieve our own goals as a business. And it gives you some idea of how customers such as Zynga and Playfish take advantage of that to build out very social, very casual games with deep engagement and reach the sort of audience that they have the potential to are in, in the casual market. But for now, I want to focus in on um, building an audience. So how can you help build out that audience and keep that audience, retain the audience over time? So we have these tools available to us. Right? We can use social networks. We can use uh, game devices, achievements, and leaderboards. We can use uh, downloadable content, uh, which people may get for free, updates to games, which people may want to pay for, new levels, et cetera. And we have a variety of devices uh, which we can deploy across, um, let alone multiplayer and all the rest of it. And these can help build out audiences for your games. They help build out social engagement. So they're really enabled by the cloud. It's very difficult to take full advantage if you're building these into your games without having the sort of scalable architectures uh, that we talked about. So they can help drive engagement, which is really important because it keeps people playing for longer. It allows them to see more ads. It allows them to tell their friends what they're playing uh, so you can drive uh, an even larger audience. And it allows you to respond quickly to viral lift taking the opportunity presented by a large audience arriving very quickly. Now, if you think about a spectrum of games, um, you can sort of think about them in a number of different dimensions. The first is that they may be quite static, point and click uh, type adventures, uh, very asset heavy. Uh, they may be more dynamic, a 3D browser based game or an MMO, something like that. They may be simple, a uh, simple sliding block puzzle. They may be incredibly complex with leveling systems and all the rest of it. And they may aim uh, for a specific niche audience, or they may aim for a very mass market audience. And I'm sure you're all plotting at the moment on the three axes where your games are in three-dimensional space. But no matter where you're dealing with a niche market or a mass market, a complex game or a, 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 a very simple game, availability of that game, getting that game into the browser, allowing you to respond quickly to customers that want to play that game is very, very important. The one problem with this is when you're dealing with computer systems, um, everything fails all of the time. And it will fail at the worst possible time and at the worst possible minute. And when you're on pager duty at 3 o'clock in the morning, you can guarantee that it'll become unavailable as you finally achieve the viral lift for your game. So uh, what can we do about that? Uh, this is a, a, another example of what I'm talking about. What I hope doesn't happen is that when you start getting more games like this, more gamers, and you start to add these uh, additional features to your games to drive even larger audiences, uh, you, they start to come in, and then this happens. You start having massive infrastructure failures, massive problems with your, with your compute, and uh, all your customers are just going to disappear because they can't play the game that they want to play. Hopefully, Elastic Infrastructure can help you uh, uh, remove this problem. So I think a bit about it in a number of different ways. So the first thing I think about is uh, availability of data. Um, so this usually involves using a cloud storage service. Uh, Amazon has one called S3, the simple storage service. Um, this basically allows you to store your data uh, in a secure platform. Uh, everything is private by default, and you can start to open that up. So if you want to do asset delivery, you can do it with that. If you want a backup player uh, data, you can do that as well. And we'll make sure that it follows the sort of best practices of storing that data and making sure that it's available to you if you want to mine it uh, or to your customers if they want to access the assets. So we make sure that it's replicated across multiple physical drives. 
Uh, so we have the concept of what we call availability zones. Uh, these availability zones are hosted in separate floodplains and fault lines. They have redundant connectivity and redundant networking and all the rest of it. And uh, we'll make sure that your, uh, your, your data is spread across these availability zones. And you can do the same thing with your applications so that in the event that an entire data center even fails, uh, we can still uh, make your data available, still deliver your assets. Uh, so this is a very, very important to make sure that your data stays available. Um, and we actually build out uh, 11 nines of data durability. Uh, so S3 itself is tolerant to two simultaneous points of failure, uh, but we can still make sure that your assets are flowing uh, with this very, very high levels of data durability. And to give you the sense of the scale at which we're operating, these are the latest numbers that we pulled out. Uh, so you can see the different quarters uh, from 2006 when we launched uh, the storage service all the way up to Q4 uh, uh, this year, last year. Uh, 762 billion objects uh, that we're storing. And I'm no mathematician, but I certainly know exponential growth when I see it. And I don't think we've seen uh, the, 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 the inflection point of this, of this graph. And those are accessed at 500,000 uh, peak requests per second. Uh, so we're keeping up with our customers' demands. And uh, S3 is a very durable way of ensuring that your assets are delivered, of ensuring that your player data is secured. So speaking of assets, it's also obviously important that those are as available as possible to your customers. Any amount of downtime, any amount of delay is going to reduce the happiness of your customers. So in my slightly bleached out graph, again, you can see the problem, right? So if your data is physically, co -located, physically located rather, uh, in, uh, in our data centers in our region over in Europe, and you have a customer over there in, uh, in Hong Kong uh, that wants to take advantage of them, those assets have to come a long way. That, that code, the downloadable content, has to come a long way. It's a long way through the network. There's a high amount of latency. You get slow download speeds. Uh, generally, everybody's nobody's not very happy about that. So uh, with that, you can just plug in a content distribution network in front of things. Uh, and that means that um, we'll take that data, and the first time it's accessed, move it to one of our physical edge locations. That's the little blue dots here. Uh, and we'll cache that data there so that the next request that comes in from that customer or that customer in that geography will get that uh, data, that asset, be it a background or a texture or a high score table or anything like that. We'll make sure it's cached and we'll deliver it up to, uh, up to your customers uh, using this uh, distribution network. So you get much lower latency and yet much faster downloads, uh, which ultimately means happier players. They get what they want more quickly. It makes you seem a lot more um, uh, responsive as, a, as an application, as a game, uh, everything along, they'll play for longer, et cetera. We also have available compute. Uh, Carlos is going to talk a little bit more about this in his workshop uh, after this. But if you'll forgive the slightly technical slides, uh, we have a typical application here of web servers, application servers, and some sort of data store. This is typically how uh, the back ends of games work. Um, now, the problem is that uh, in traditionally provisioned uh, infrastructures, we've been focused in, we've been restricted by the IT to such a point where we've had to start making trade-offs against availability. The cost of compute is so high that we cannot buy more of it as and when we need it, and it takes so long to provision that you can't respond quickly in the event of a failure without having a full backup system somewhere else, which is only active 5% of the time when you're having problems. Um, in these sort of three-tier applications, we can work around that because we don't have to work within the constraints of statically provisioned infrastructure. So we can start to break out and add multiple levels of redundancy in terms of compute uh, for, our, for our application servers and our web servers and for our data store. This makes them much more tolerant to failure. Individual things will fail, and uh, servers will fail in the cloud, just like they'll fail anywhere else. But you can respond to that much, much more quickly you, by replacing them and by adding these levels of, of redundancy. You can even do that, as I said before, by mirroring your application across these availability zones. So if an availability zone becomes unavailable for any reason, your application is still running because you're still available in the, in the other region. And ultimately, you get more scale because you can add and shrink these in layers down as necessary. But what about the data store? Um, so obviously, games generate uh, quite a lot of data, usually, player data, player analytics data. Uh, and this data is super valuable. Uh, it can really fuel, as we'll see in a minute, uh, really fuel you to be more innovative, to iterate more quickly. Uh, it's very valuable, but it's very plentiful. Uh, if you have a couple of hundred million customers, a couple of hundred million players, and uh, you want to collect metrics on all of those guys, and they're all playing at the same time, that's a lot of metrics, and they're going to come in in a complex way, uh, in a way which may change over time. So it might be unstructured data. Uh, you might want to change the amount of information that you want to collect and the format it's in. And it's also in flux. So it's very complex, and it's continually changing. 
It's also very fast moving. All of these things are going to come in. You can't possibly cache this stuff somewhere to deal with it later because there's just going to be more behind it that you want to have to deal with. And it's very valuable data, very valuable data that you want to take advantage of by asking a number of different questions. So capturing and managing this data is very, very challenging, uh, even though the data itself is powerful because it allows you to innovate more quickly, as we'll see later on. So scalable storage, such as the simple storage service that I talked about, can help having these high levels of replication to make sure your data is available. Um, but typically, the database is a bottleneck. Uh, so the database that's going to record all of this uh, is typically the, the bottleneck in taking advantage, but also just managing the storage of that data underneath the database can be very, very challenging. You typically start to see degraded performance as the data set grows. So as you have more customers and have more players, as more infrastructure is built, uh, your database will get slower and slower for reporting, uh, for delivering uh, content to your players. So you have this degraded performance. And that leads to just unhappy customers. They're not going to play your game. They're not going to talk about it. And this is a very, very common problem, particularly in social and casual gaming. Um, so uh, a couple of weeks ago, we launched a new service uh, called DynamoDB. Uh, you can read more about it at aws.amazon.com slash DynamoDB. And DynamoDB tries to solve this problem for you in a very specific way. So DynamoDB is a NoSQL database service. This means that it handles unstructured data uh, that you can query against, uh, and it has some really nice features. So it's fully managed. You don't have to worry about the storage underneath it. You don't have to worry about all this complexity in maintaining a reliable, redundant store or worrying about failures and all the rest of it. All of that is hidden in the guts of DynamoDB. All you have to do is send data to it and write queries to get data out of it. It's very, very easy. And it has unlimited storage underneath it. You don't have to worry about provisioning the disks. You don't have to worry about worrying about S3 and backups and all the rest of it. Uh, it's unlimited, and it provides consistent performance. So no matter how big your data set gets, whether you're moving from 500,000 customers to 500 million customers, uh, you'll get consistent performance uh, with DynamoDB. It's very technically challenging to do. We do it by, in part, providing uh, solid state disks that so use flash storage under the hood. And it also works against the idea of provision throughput. So you basically tell DynamoDB the sort of throughput you want in the number of reads and writes per second, and it'll make sure that it manages the scalable infrastructure underneath to be able to deliver that performance to you. And you can scale that up and down as necessary, and you pay for more or pay for less. So you just change the amount of throughput that you want DynamoDB to provide. But critically, you can scale without downtime. So as you start to see your customers ramping up, getting more and more millions of customers, more and more players. You want to be able to capture that data at that critical point in time. You can just start to scale DynamoDB up. You tweak the dial, and everything else in terms of the storage and the replication and delivering this consistent performance happens under the hood. This is custom built for gaming and for gaming analytics. There's also a point about uh, disaster recovery. Uh, what happens uh, if you suddenly are running in a traditional colo, for example, traditional colo, and you have some power problem? Uh, a lot of our customers are starting to use uh, Amazon Web Services for disaster recovery purposes. And there's a lot that we can talk about there in terms of moving your virtual machine images. We can peer with your network for fast data input and all the rest of it. And you can spin up uh, the storage and the compute uh, as and when you need it without running it the rest of the time. So disaster recovery is a, a big use case uh, in gaming and a lot of other fields for the cloud. So finally, I want to talk about uh, building a responsive organization. So I want to pull a lot of what we talked about in terms of delivering games in an available way, in terms of capturing player data, and talk about how we can build out a more responsive organization. So here I'm really focusing in on our developers, our ops, our QA team, uh, everything that's running the staging and the production environment for app our applications. So this is the sort of traditional way of building games. Three, four, five, ten years ago, this is how we were working. We'd have the idea, the concept for our game. We move into pre-production. We get greenlit, get some funding behind us. Then we start some development. And then towards the end of that development cycle, uh, we'd start probably to do some user forums or user testing of some kind. And that might loop back in, if you're lucky, into the development cycle so you can use what customers are saying uh, to try and improve, improve development. After that, you go through a QA step. And finally, you ship and maybe add some additional downloadable content to the end of it. Now, the problem with this is that it used to take about uh, two to three years to actually complete this process and get the game out of the door. So there's a huge lead time here between having your idea, going through the production development side process, and actually shipping it before you even start working on the downloadable content. So there's a large lead time between idea and actually shipping your product. 
So it's a very, very long time to market. A lot can happen in three years. New devices, for example, new markets, new social networks. Uh, and it's very expensive. You've got a lot of developers spending a lot of time, a lot of artists developing a lot of assets uh, for a game which is going to be released at some point in the future. And it has higher risk because we don't know, particularly in the casual space, how successful a particular game is going to be ahead of time. So a lot of customers, particularly smaller startups, are starting to move to a much more agile, much more flexible, much leaner approach to developing games. They'll have their idea, go straight into development, and start thinking about the, uh, the, the, the minimum viable game that they can release, something which is ex fun to play, and they can start collecting data around to drive the rest of the development process. So they'll release early, they'll evaluate the player data that they can collect, and then they'll start to iterate or pivot on those ideas to be able to reach new uh, business objectives, meet new customer demands. So this is much, much faster. You can get a game and a minimal viable product out of the door with the sort of frameworks that we see for mobile devices uh, in about three months. And after that, you can iterate very, very, very quickly. So I've put a month up here. Uh, I've seen customers do it in an hour. So they'll roll out uh, 10, 20 updates each and every day and uh, just keep iterating as quickly as possible. And the crit critical part here is in being able to collect the customer data at scale and being able to push that, uh, use that to drive the development process in a very flexible, agile way. So honing in on these rapid iterations, honing in on the ability to be able to transform your business, transform your games based on player behavior very, very quickly, and move towards a more continual tuning model. Not just delivering uh, new armor sets and new swords in downloadable content, but delivering and tuning the game experience setting the levels correctly, designing the maps based on how customers are already using the game. And this all comes from the availability of being able to address customers as and when they want to come and start playing your game, to be able to collect that data and actually ask questions of it later on. So this data-driven approach is becoming very, very popular, and uh, it's uh, something which we would definitely recommend, something we do at Amazon. You can also do it at lower cost because you don't have to spin up this large infrastructure just to be able to deliver the game. You can start to scale up as you get the customers, as you start to generate revenue. And uh, some, customers call this, uh, some people call this failing fast, uh, but I think of it as succeeding fast. Uh, you want to be able to uh, actually capture the data and actually be able to put that into the game quickly and get that out to customers uh, using these content delivery available data mechanisms. So player analytics is kind of a, a big deal, I think. Uh, it's really one of the areas that is enabled by cloud computing by pulling these different focal points together, working and looking at the progression of people as they move through the levels, whether you spent all that time designing the underwater system, the underwater caves that no player has ever swum in, and being able to remove that, not waste any more time on it, or to, to try and uh, direct players uh, into that area so that they get more value from uh, what you've already invested in. So you can ask questions of player data. Um, player data becomes part of the development process, not just something which is uh, added on for reporting after the fact, uh, but actually something which becomes integrated into the rapid iterations of, of your development. So there's two stages to this. Obviously, you want to be able to collect and store it. Uh, we talked a little bit about that with S3 and DynamoDB. And you also want to be able to analyze it and Believe me, you will need the scale if you have hundreds of millions, hundreds of billions of data points that you want to be able to analyze. You are going to need the sort of scale that we saw from Netflix in, uh, in asking questions of this data. So a lot of customers are using a tool called Hadoop. Um, this is an open source tool which allows you to work with these very, very large data collections. Uh, it's kind of a pain to run and tune at scale, uh, so we can help you out in that. We have a service called Elastic MapReduce, which is a sort of managed Hadoop. Uh, you can take advantage of these large data sets. And as you might expect, that integrates nicely with DynamoDB. So you can run a large distributed Hadoop cluster and work with the data uh, that is live in your DynamoDB database and query that against maybe archive data, which you have in S3. So it's a very, very flexible system for uh, analytics, asking questions of your data, and ultimately to be able to iterate. So taking collection, storage, a analytical process, and being able to iterate quickly in the development process. So my wish for all of you, is that you don't have to build another power station. You don't have to be able to go out, run, maintain, and build a power station. Uh, you can just use compute and infrastructure as a utility. Moving from people that just want to make games, having to build out a diesel generator, to plugging into the wall and just flicking the switch when you want access to it, and ultimately to be able to build great games and to be able to build great businesses. That's my wish for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. You're welcome. That covered a lot of stuff yes. in a fairly short period of time, but we do have some time for some questions. We have about five minutes for questions, which is one or two. Any questions from the audience for Matt at Amazon? 
right. I think you made their brains explode. Good. That's what I'm here for. I'll be around all afternoon. Oh, um, wait. Oh. Do you really have a question, Nick? All right, <laughs> make one up for us. I, I hope so. <laughs> so, question about the ownership of the data. If I put data on your services, who owns the data and who has control over it? You do. Okay, so let's say you've received a legal subpoena from someone mandating you release data. Do you do that? Do you have a team of legal specialists deal with that, or do you push it right the way back to the customer? Um, so, I'm not a lawyer, um, so um, you should do your own due diligence around this, uh, but we'll always push it back to the customer. Uh, they're responsible for the data, uh, they have ownership of the data, and uh, if you have, that is something that you're concerned about, you should do your own due diligence around it. And even if somebody comes with you with a very large stick and says, you're breaching my copyright, you have inappropriate content in your service, cease and desist immediately, you'll say, not our problem, go talk to the people who put it up there. It's your data, uh, it's your responsibility, and you should do your own due diligence around exactly that. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions? Awesome. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.